All right, this is it, part two, wheels and tires. Today on the show, as you guessed it, it's gonna be a follow-up to our part one, lifts and lift kits. Uh, we're gonna talk about wheels, wheels, rims, tires, re-gearing, when to do it, tons of information coming at you today. As always, joined by my two co-hosts, we've got Ryan Stoangi from Combat Off-Road and Tim Rogers from TMR Customs, two of the Smartest guys I know when it comes to this stuff. I'm so glad, as always, to have them with us. Um, I'm super glad you're here, so thanks for watching. Once again, here we are, part two, wheels and tires. Let's get into it. All right, so yeah, so let's just get into it. So welcome everyone to our episode on wheels and tires and follow up to uh, our first episode last week which was lifts and all that fun jazz so yeah welcome guys good to see you both it's been a, a while how's uh, how's the week been getting there yeah good stuff it feels like a week to me yeah nice tim I, everything everything how, how's the gladiator i i saw you uh, managed to stick four 40s in there yeah so i had to get some uh tires for our uh our race program so i had eight ordered in and then uh, i had to go pick them up and i was i had one here and we're like you drop the tailgate on that thing and you're like this bed's fucking useless like <laughs> what the <laughs> what the hell so then we we figured it out anyways we could fit four so i was happy it only meant uh two trips out to get the uh eight tires but it's funny i post the picture up and then people are like oh you, you putting those on that and i'm like we can get into this later because we are talking tires on this episode but uh Mm. Anyways, yeah, it, it works better than I thought. But yeah, the, the bed size is, is not the greatest if you're used to coming from a full-size truck, that's for sure. Nice. <laughs> right on. Cool. Awesome. And Ryan, uh, anything new happening over at Off-Road or at Combat? I'm, I'm sure lots, but since we last yeah. spoke. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, uh, yeah, we're just putting in, we spent a bunch of time last night into the morning, just uh, got our RJL on the 42s there, 41 and a half, so we got it on the ground. Nice. So, uh it was good. We stayed an extra bunch of hours just to hit that hit that uh, goal, right? That target. So, yeah, I'm kind of half half here, half uh, half pretending I'm in bed at home right now. I, uh, I'm getting too old to stay up all night and do that kind of junk. I <laughs> right broke on. a rat and I crunched myself. I, uh, the ratchet gear broke and it came down and I bludgeoned myself in my face oh, last nice. night. Pretty mate. I don't even know the last time. I haven't had face pain since I played hockey. So <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, we'll have to get a picture of the of the jail on the forty. On the, you said forty ones, yeah. Forty one and a half, yeah. Forty one and a half. Holy crap, that's awesome. We gotta do some tweaking still too, but uh, it was just it's finally sitting right. So like everything's still loose, and we were playing with arm links at the top. Like we did three link, three link, like our own custom kit, and uh, we stole uh, we stole some of Tim's brackets. Uh, we made some back ones, and we stole some front ones, and we. I what I had because I had some extra ones, so it's a bit of a, bit of a Frankenstein-y kind of truck, right? So because it was in a rush for uh, Easter Jeep, but then obviously it got canceled, and then we're like, ah. Oh. But I was already like, we were at the finish line. We had like three or four more big days of work. So, but we'll basically model off this, and then we'll drop some real, like not real brackets. I didn't mean that, but <laughs> we'll drop some brackets that are that are specifically suited, you know. But. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm excited for you guys to see that thing. It's uh, it's pretty hilarious. We still got on the little guy axles because there's only so much money you can squeak out of this stone here. So <laughs> I wanted to, uh, we'll give it a try. It, those tires are so heavy, it's insane. I was laughing. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm going to be changing these axles up faster than I think. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think you're going to make it to any events? I know you said that you had that ready for Easter Jeep, but uh, I think, isn't there that one in Tennessee still going on, I think? The, the Smoky Mountains, yeah, Smoky uh, Mountain, yeah. Yeah. they said they're still go. Like we got a spot there. Um, we got a, we had a spot at all of them, right? Um, so yeah, they still they they said they're still go. I don't know. I know there's one this next weekend in uh, somewhere in Florida. I can't remember. A couple of my friends in Georgia are going. Like American Warrior Garage is going. Um, I know Kurt's going. Mission Twenty Two, so uh, they're going to be there promoting for the vets, but. Uh, Nice. that's still gonna be a go like I, I don't know how that's gonna go hopefully it goes well i know that uh you know the virus stuff's still kicking down there pretty hard and i think they they got like 25 percent of the world's cases right now or something right 
Yeah, yeah. So I just hope everyone's uh, everyone stays well. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm gonna I'm just gonna wait it out, man. I mean, I'm hoping for SEMA at the very least. If if we can save one for the year, I guess yeah. that's the end of the year. That's as far as we can go, and I'm happy for that. If uh, if it goes, if not, whatever. I'll live another day, right? Just yep. do it next. Yep, yeah. fair enough. Cool. Awesome. All right. Well, let's uh, let's jump into the wheels and tires. Um, I know that this is a, a super popular subject on forums. Basically, see it just about every day. I'm sure you you both hear it almost every day. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. So maybe we can uh, answer some questions and uh, and help some people out. Um, before we get started, though, let's start. Let's talk about the uh, product of the week. Uh, this week, you know, keeping in the theme of wheels and tires, we're going to talk about the Combat Rapid Tire Deflator. Ryan, why don't you tell us all about it? I think you probably have one there, yeah? Yeah. Perfect. There so, it is. <laughs> so basically, uh, this is how you get it. comes in a nice little case. Keeps it clean. Keeps it knowing where it is. So basically, this one's shiny new, so it's still got a plastic on it. Do 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 do. So you want to, so just features about it, uh, basically it's mechanical, so you don't have to worry about batteries failing. It's got a rubber protective case of so you're dropping it or whatever, you know it on the trail, no big deal, it should be just fine. And if it does fail for any reason, uh, we got a lifetime warranty, just, uh, we just, we just asked for a cool video for a field destroy for us. So you can, you know, run it over or blow it up, I don't care. And then, I, you know, as long as we prove it's effective, so don't go breaking your good one because then I won't give you one. So... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so you know just crimped ends braided line uh brass fittings so if anyone doesn't want it, doesn't know how these things work i'll try and do it really quick so here's the camera blah blah blah. so if you i don't know if you can see inside but that little guy in there that basically takes out uh inside your uh valve stem right just the core so basically what you're going to do this part's threaded so you pull that back i would basically just screw this guy on to your regular valve stem I reach in here and I pull out the valve core and you'll feel some air pressure. This kind of, this slides back and forth and just locks it out, right? So then we'd, we'd maintain pressure, we'd release pressure. So this would kind of go like this. The core kind of sits in here. So it just lets you release a whole volume of air instead of like using your car keys or, you know, stuns, I find they're never accurate. You know, they'll stay good for a little bit and this, that, and the other. Um, this gauge is really accurate. I'm pretty impressed with them. So if you have a newer vehicle and gives you tire pressure readings. Uh, I find it's on the money uh, every time. An assortment of them, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 different ones we've been trying at a time. It's, it's real accurate. So basically, you just release the air, you close it, it pressurizes the gauge, tells you where you're at. If you like that, no, and it won't, we can talk about that too later, you know, pressure. And you just want to reverse the process, put the core back in, pull this back off, and then you're good in literally minutes, you know. If you're reaper these things to do each tire all I don't know too many people that do that. I've done two at a time because I have a bunch of these because we're testing them, but in all seriousness, you just need one. Perfect. No, that's great. No, and I I think it's uh one of the things you that point out. To... Oh sorry, I cut out there that last one. What was that, sorry? Oh it is it just looks so serious. Oh yeah. <laughs> This is serious business. <laughs> I, I was going to say, one of the things yeah, that I thought was... It's, it's super, about it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I thought was super cool about that one, about this particular tire deflator that I hadn't considered was was the analog. Because at, at first, you know, I've seen the digital ones and, you know, being a sort of digital person, I'm like, hey, digital, like that's just the way to go. But I think you brought up a really good point. Like from, a, you know, a, if you're actually think about it and it sits in a bag and you're only going out a few times a year you know having the analog one probably makes a lot of sense because it you don't have to rely on batteries you don't have to check it you know it just it should just work yeah every time man yeah exactly yeah, yeah i hate to you plan a big weekend and stuff and then you're the only guy at the tire deflator and all your friends are like man we can't air down our tires <laughs> you loser you didn't bring spare batteries yeah. you know what i mean that would suck yeah you gotta use the old key yeah that'd be brutal Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Especially if you're running forty-one and a half, right? Can you imagine? That's right. <laughs> you're there all week. You're right. You'd miss dinner. It'd be over. Awesome. Okay. Cool. All right. Well. Good. So that's awesome. So if, if 
we'll put a, a link to that in the description below and in the show notes. So if anyone uh, wants to check out the rapid tire deflator from combat, they can get it just down there. Awesome. All right. Well, let's talk about, let's, let's maybe rewind a little bit in terms of our understanding of how to read the tire sizes. So Tim, why don't you tell us a little bit about the little numbers that are on the side of the, of the, the tire. I, I assume most people know what they are, but if somebody's new to the jeeping and you know they want, they're trying to figure out like what's the difference between the, this one says 33 and this one says 285, you know maybe we should start there. Sure. So for most uh, what's called jeep related tires or tires you're going to have an interest in running in, on a jeep, they're probably going to be sized in imperial. So we're talking 33, 35, 37, 40. Um, that refers to the overall height, um, and then you're going to see a by like X twelve fifty thirteen fifty. That's simply the width of the tire, and then the third number is going to be your fifteen sixteen seventeen eighteen twenty. That's your rim size. So the imperial sizes like that are super easy to understand, being that that's primarily the off road market. That's generally what I deal with. The other ones, if you want to talk a metric size, and I know we're going to get into wheels and offset, but Ryan and better be, be better. Uh, able to explain your section width and whatnot like on a uh, on a metric tire size because he would see that probably more with the trucks and uh, sure. any sport that sort of thing yeah okay ryan tell us about the 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 metric side of things well basically just, it's a sidewall and then that and then that aspect ratio ratio percentage right so all in all so you don't have to remember what i'm saying the beauty of the internet now is you can just go on and just go like tiresize.com right and you could literally do like like a common tire that that's mismatched uh, that isn't quite the exact same size, but it's kind of thought three fifteen like seventy seventeen, and then we got thirty five twelve five seventeen, right? So there's a variance between them, and uh, sometimes there's a price difference, and then uh, it's kind of like a snowball. So some tires, metric tires, have have a bigger rating too. So there's just more materials in there for more load, and you can do different load ranges. So that's another thing to watch when you're buying tires. Just make sure your load range, right? Because you don't want a tire. Like if I put like a light truck tire, but like a D or an E range tire on like a G, it's going to be really stiff. <clears throat> so it's not going to really perform off road the way you want it to. It's going to be heavier. It's going to be, uh, it'd be a little louder. Like, I don't know if you would notice that, but um, you definitely notice the weight and you definitely notice the price. So you could be overpaying in a sense. You know what I mean? You're going to, tires are pretty much, well, obviously demand, but materials, you kind of get what you pay for, right? Quality materials, the amount of materials, like sidewalls, all that kind of stuff. And we're kind of going off, but it's just something where people are like, oh, I don't know why this tire is so much money, but you can either you get a, a metric or a standard equivalent. You can check for that for pricing. And like I said, you don't want to go too much of a low range. Like, like I want a D range or an E range on a pickup truck, right? And pickup trucks can run the same size tires as Jeeps you know, depending on what modifications you do. So that's, that's just something kind of to watch. But if you're ever unsure, like the beauty of the internet, right. Or your phone, like you just take it out and just go like tire size.com. Like even my guys on the counter use it. We go through so many different sizes and, uh, that'll give you an idea. But, uh, yeah, I think load range is the one that, you know, gets people sometimes. And, uh, yeah, you'll be like running like a stone down the road. You would have no idea. And then you go to air down your air down, that's great, but the sidewall won't deflect at all because it's such a heavy tire meant for, you know, like like work use in that sense. Right, sure. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, and we'll circle back on the sidewall issue in, in particular when we talk about airing down and a lot of fun stuff. Okay, so then let's talk about, let's talk about maybe, maybe this is for people who, you know, they just bought a Jeep, they've got the stock tire, you know, and they're looking to upgrade, but, you know, they're probably using it as their daily, won't be seeing much off-road. Let's start with a 33-inch tire. Tim, what are some of the pros and cons and, and things that we can need to consider when we're moving from a regular stock to a 33? It's not, I mean, if we're talking a JK or a JL, it's not going to be a much of a bump in size. So, I mean, keep that in mind. So, if you go with a more aggressive looking all train or mud train, it's going to somewhat alter the cosmetics of the vehicle, but it's probably not going to change the ride dynamic a whole lot. So, to me, if people ask me, I would tell most people on a, on a JK or JL or, or Gladiator to just I would jump to a 35. I wouldn't really think a 33 plays into that market anymore. 33s used to be big on a TJ. Like I remember TJ's like 706, a 97 to 2000, like a 33. That that was a big ass tire. Same on an XJ or YJ. Like that that was a legit tire size. But if we're looking at the newer Jeeps, obviously they're 
physically larger and the wheel well openings are a lot larger. So if it's a newer Jeep, I, I would skip over a 33 inch tire, I think, unless you want factory like ride and handling, but maybe you just want to put something more aggressive on there to cosmetically change it. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. So from a cosmetic standpoint, 33s, but if you're, <laughs> you're expecting to, you know, maybe take it off road and perform a little bit better, just go straight to the 35s. Okay. Yeah. Especially in the four door, right? Like the four door, or like the Braco Wrangle is brutal on those. So if you thought you're going to spend some money and go off road and just go up to 33s, like sometimes the tire is actually going to be like a 0.2 inches shorter, but an inch, you know, an inch wider, right? When you start, you just got to know those calculations. You don't have to know them. You just got to be aware that you have to sort that out. So you could punch in your factory tire size and then punch in the size that you think would work or at least to get an idea of the difference, you know what I mean, in your own head before you go pulling the trigger. Or you just call like a, like a shop that kind of not a tire shop you know what i mean like there might be the odd tire shop that that would be familiar with it but like a real off-road shop is gonna know you know what i mean so that that'd be the best way to do it just kind of get that information and then you can just double check it just to be sure that that's kind of what you like and if you really want to get out of you go there the tape measure on your stock tire and go oh, i'm gonna add a whole inch here and i'm gonna add a half inch here kind of just paint yourself a picture of what you're getting but like like our shop you know obviously i'm biased but i mean we're pretty good on the counter for that kind of stuff and we know what's going to fit and uh, because it's all real world experience right like we know that this fits and we know if you want to keep your stock wheel we can run x tire and if you have a rubicon you can run this x tire you know what i mean like jl rubicon you can run the stock wheel if you want you don't really need a spacer and you can do 35 12 fives you know what i mean right out of the box so when you get into the other ones the sports and the the other models, you're going to want to at least put it up a couple inches just to get some room to move around, right? And uh, we even RGL, when we first had it, we threw some 35s on it just to test it and uh, on the stock wheels, and it, it fit just fine. Everything everything worked okay. uh, worked Perfect. its way around. Uh, this, the other thing, too, is, yeah, it's all fine and dandy if you fit the tire, but you just got to figure out, you know, gear ratio, too, right? You know, the eight speeds are pretty good, so you can kind of get away with a long leeway. Um, and then, and then another snowball is you're going to want, it's, it's all computer controlled, right? So you're going to want like a, like a pro cal or some kind of like a super chips product, something to let, let the computer know that we're out of, out of that round. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the tire, this big's going to spin so fast, tire, this big's going to spin so much slower is going to change everything. And the train is going to want to know it gets wheel speed readings and tells the transmission when the shift and all that stuff. So. There's a, there's a few little components, like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, you could just smash some tires on there and get away with it and lose fifth gear and all that kind of stuff, right? Which, like, a million people did if they didn't want to gear it. Right. Um, but now, you if you get the auto, you're going to want to play all those little games. There's a couple couple pieces of the puzzle. Okay. So what we're saying, basically, is 33 is essentially stock, not going to have much in the way of a, a fuel difference, not going to have much difference in the way of a ride. In fact, the JL Rubicon comes with 33s, so... We're saying basically, look, at this day and age, if, if you're, you're going to upgrade your tire, you might as well, let's start looking at a 35. Is that fair to yeah, say? If you're, if yeah, you're in the, if you're in the JL platform, for sure. The JK is still like a 33 on a sport. It's, it's tight. You, would never, you wouldn't be able to fit the 35 on the JK. But if you're in the new, new platform, you're going you're gonna to go 35s for sure, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, well, then let's, uh, let's jump into the 35s then. So... Uh, in order to use the 35s, and I guess maybe we'll break it down. Let's start, Tim, 35s on the JK, uh, I, because I know you know you have 40s on yours, I think, right? 41s, <laughs> whatever it is, it's huge. What do we need to do in terms of like, maybe consider things like our lift and um, you know any other components that we would need in order to get to that 35? I think like two and a half inch or in that range or a little bit larger is going to be very functional. I mean, we talked about lift kit types before. So if you wanted to start out on the easiest stand to keep the most factory components, you look at like a, a lift like Ryan's got a combat. I think they do a two and a half with a shock extension. Um, I think that's a great way to do it. And then like we talked about with lift kits before, sky's the limit. People also don't factor in um, fenders as well. A lot of people can go to an aftermarket fender and that'll open up clearance for you in your wheel well. So if you've got an aftermarket fender that's raised, you can go with a, uh, a lower lift height. So it's it's just all part of the package. But uh, okay. yeah, to do a 35, it would jam a couple inches of lift in there. If you're going off-road, if it's if it's strictly street-driven, then you could probably keep it on the lower side. But uh, depends what you want out of that Jeep. So that's why you want to... Uh, refer to a good shop to get some good intel on, on what works for them and, and, and lean on people's experience. 
Cool. And sorry, you were saying you put the 35s right on the JL and really with no issues. Would you have been able to take it off-road or do we need to, even on the JL, even with the Rubicon, should we be putting some at least yeah. some sort of space there? On the on the Rubicon, you can. You just got that inch and a half more, like, fender. So their fenders are just cooked up a little bit, right? So that, that like just Tim was talking about. So that's the big difference in the Rubicon is just the fenders have some more clearance. And then you can get into another thing that we did with ours. We use um, we use a rugged ridge chop kit. So basically, those JL fenders are really big and bulky. Like they're like a like a Playmobil set. Like they're intense. So there's like three pieces in there. So basically, you take them all apart, uh, and then you're just left with the outer fender. So whenever we check out my my JL, you'll see it. And it just comes with uh, like a steel powder coated bracket up front. It comes with some LED lights. I didn't really enjoy them. I switched them up for the grody lights, uh, just a little little markers and stuff. But uh, that gives you even more clearance and more ability to tuck the wheel up in the in the wheel well. Really depends if you like the look. Like it does look like a stripped down fender, but uh, the outside of the fender just when you they're like a slot. They're like plastic slots. So you just got to get a nice fine razor blade. And if you trim that off so nice, it looks like a finish because you still keep that factory finish. To, on that one line so uh i'm really happy with the chop kit and then like i said you get a little more a little more room it's funny how all this snowballs eh? it's not like so like hey this is (laughs) and that's because now it's got me thinking i know american adventure lab has some pretty sick leds and like a a bracket for the for like the chop kit right so you can basically get rid of those factory leds and uh and replace them and they look they're pretty sick and and again they you know apparently open up an extra couple inches yeah, you got tons more space, and it's uh, it allows that fender to be a little more pliable too, because you don't have all those layers, right? Right. So uh, yeah, yeah we'll I'm pretty happy to, with that. We'll have a few chop kits out there. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, so then, uh, Tim, think about again the 35s. Are we are we talking? Um, do we need anything? And and Ryan, we'll come back to you because I think you mentioned it earlier, but. What else do we need to run a 35 on, let's say, a JK? Um, do we need anything else, or can we just throw on the wheels and maybe get a, a bit of a lift and we should be okay? Or do we need to get into, like, recalibrating um, the speedometer or looking at regearing? Yeah, I would recalibrate the speedometer for sure. So, I mean, pick up yourself a good programmer like Ryan's meshing earlier. I mean, there's other benefits to those, too, in terms of playing with your daytime running. And there's other features built into those that people will tap into. So I don't think that's a bad idea. Do you need it? No. Are you going to enjoy it? Yeah, I think so, just because you can do more with it. I know, like, I, uh, when I first had my TJ, threw 35s on it, didn't regear it. Like Brian says, he was fifth gear going up some hills. I didn't regear because it was basically like a little Speedo unit in the transfer case back in those Jeeps. I never did it. I knew my speedometer was basically 10% under, but, I mean, if you're driving a newer vehicle. I think that kind of sucks. Um, <laughs> so I, I would get it rock and proper. But, no, I mean, if you if you want to do it on a budget, get it and – and change the look and function of your Jeep, you can pretty much do it with uh, minimal parts out of the box. Right on. Cool. Yeah, I have one of those super cal- or the super chips. The- yeah. Yeah, I love it. It's awesome. There's so many things you can do with it. You can turn off, like, the, the sensors when you're off-roading for your wheels so you don't have things, you know, going off all the time. And, um, yeah, it looks pretty awesome. Um, now, Ryan, does it depend also if you, like, if you have a sport, you have a different gear ratio than like if you have a Rubicon, especially true in the the J uh, sorry the JKs. Do we if so if I'm driving a Sport with 35s, do I need to consider something other than if I'm driving like a Rubicon? Obviously, the Rubicon can probably handle the 35. Yeah, you're gonna have a <clears throat> like an assortment two or three different gears uh, that from the factory. So another loaded question in a sense where if you're gonna order your own Jeep. And you know you want to put some bigger stuff on it, I would pick, like, a certain gear ratio, you know, whatever you can get. Like, at the minimum, if you're going to put a bigger tire on it, 373s, right? And the Rubicon, I know some of the Rubicons came 373s, so try to avoid that one if you want a bigger tire. Uh, at least 410s, right? Uh, the beauty of the JL now, I mean, we're talking a lot of new stuff, but uh, the eight speed training gives you a little more. The, the gears are just nicer. There's more of them. It can kind of find its way, whereas the other auto tranny, I can't remember if it was a five-speed. Or a six, six speed. Yeah. Yeah, I got one too. I don't know. I just put it in <laughs> deep. Right? Right. But, uh, but yeah, so, <clears throat> and then you got the manual transmission, like Tim was saying. We were talking about, like, sometimes on a headwind and you got the wrong gear ratio, you're going to not be able to get a six gear. You know what I mean? Um, so, 
yeah, Rubicon, you could definitely go to a bigger tire. Like we ran the four tens in the JL with the 35s and the 37s for a little bit. And then we switched to uh, four year 48s. So 48s and 37s, we have a manual. It works pretty good. Now I put 41 and a half to 48s, but I find the challenge with the small stuff, you know, we're kind of going off topic a little bit. I just don't get, I don't ever put any higher gear ratio than 48s in the small stuff, like the Dana 44s, like, you know, the quarter ton slash kind of almost half ton stuff. I just find the pinion head gets so tiny. Um, it just, just is not enough surface area when you start putting big tires on and little gears and they just they end up like, like just dying off, you know, just chipping teeth. You know what I mean? I, I find that they're a little too small. You got to get into the, the bigger stuff to get that steeper gear, in my opinion. Well, I, I was going to sure. say, maybe we should, maybe we should discuss quickly what regearing is. I think we sort of skipped over that. Maybe there are people that just don't, I mean, they sort of understand it in terms of like, you can read it in the specs and it's like, Hey, like I know I need a 410, but maybe they don't really understand exactly sort of how it works. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second, Ryan. Maybe you can explain regearing to us and the idea of how, how that sort of works. Yeah. Well, basically your differential is going to have a, a ring and a pinion and you're sending power to that, that pinion gear and it's, it's turned on a ring. It's, got so many teeth and it's it's a certain diameter right so and your tires are a certain diameter so they're kind of meant to work as one so when you change one aspect of the calculation you're kind of throwing off the whole equation right <clears throat> so basically you're going to want to you know create the ratio to match the tire right so that's all you're, doing. you're just you're changing the ratio inside so that that's how fast that's going to spin and how much torque you're going to you know so obviously it's smaller Right, so it's going to go faster, but your tire's bigger, and it's going to spin slower than your original tire. You know what I mean? So you're kind of want to. You got to speed up the gears in the center to bring it back to more of when it was matching as a small tire. You know, like just to make it real super simple <clears throat> that way. So like your tire's so big because you changed it, whereas like if it was this big, we spin this fast, but it's spinning this fast. But then if you have a like a highway gear in the middle, it takes so long for it to finish its rotation, right? So we want to speed up that rotation so we can speed up the outer wheels. So then it'll move properly, you know what I mean? That's kind of the little stick band version of it. Yeah, 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 I got it. So so the idea is that's why, for instance, I have a manual and I I really don't need to get like I, I can basically I'm one gear lower than I used to be because I have thirty five. So, you know, on the highway where I'd be in sixth before I'm in fifth. And it works just, it's just fine. Basically. You can hold, or you can hold six gear and everything? Yeah, I can hold six, but I, for the most part, I really don't even need it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, so just the, the dangers of, like, not regearing, you just create a lot of heat, and you're, you're really, like, like, sawing through the gears, you know? It's, like, a long time in first, a long time in second. Like, if you're, like, at 321 and 35s, like, you're going to find that, and you're going to find, like, it's useless. So you're just creating a lot of extra heat, you're you're wasting a lot of fuel because you're really working the motor to get it through all the gears, right? <clears throat> so you're burning up fuel. So basically, I know it's an expensive game, but uh, you're going to pick up fuel economy if you're keeping the vehicle. You're going to really have you're going to extend the life of the of the vehicle, like tranny motor, all that fun stuff. So okay, right on. Okay, so let's get back into it. So so that's awesome. But so I think we can sum up and say so. Thirty fives we're looking at. Probably for the most part, especially on the JKs and the JKUs, we'd be looking at a small lift, whether it's a spacer lift or you know a couple of inches. Probably can run the 35s on the stock gear ratio for the most part. Might be a good idea to upgrade, but you're probably okay. Fuel economy is going to be hurt, and and we might want to use something like a, a super chip or what have you to calibrate the the uh, speedometer. So. Light off-roading, well, that being said, I don't even know about light off-roading. I mean, I took, I have 35s. I love that thing. And I feel like I can drive over anything with it. <laughs> mm. With a three-inch lift, you know, it's, it's great. So, so I think what we're saying is, look, if you're, if you're going to get into off-roading and you've got a stock Jeep, 35s is a great place to start. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, for yep. sure. You don't want to do any smaller. Most people on the trails are at least... 35s is the smaller tire now, right? So basically 35s, the middle of the road now is 37s. And then kind of the bigger guy is 40s, but more common than not. And then we got the uh, 42s that are kind of the, the gigantic tire now. You know what I mean? For 
I mean, that's what I see, in my opinion, right? So. Right. Okay. Well, you don't want to get on the trail with 33s and a bunch of people are averaging out at 37s, and then, you know, it's going to be more challenging. Like, I think we talked about it at some point before. I was going to say, but, I think you mentioned that. Yeah, to, yeah. to just basically, you know, whatever you're going out with, the, 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 the crew you're going out with, make sure you're sort of on par. Or just, or just be mindful of if you're following somebody on 37s, it's not the same path as a 33 guy. You know what I mean? Just keep that in mind. You're going to be bashing diffs. And, <laughs> yeah. you know? I know. Yeah. I followed Tim on his on his uh, in Super Jeep last year, and my 35s did all right. But yeah, he was literally like he's going over things like they're not even there. Meanwhile, oh, yeah. I'm like you know going off. Yeah. It's crazy. So yeah, no, it totally makes a lot of sense. Uh, actually, speaking of that, Tim, you run a 37 on a Rubicon with no lift, correct? Um, yeah. Tell yeah. us about that. How did you manage to do that? Because you must have had to do something to make it fit. Yeah, it's it's just fender clearance. I run a set of MC uh, flat fenders. So they open up a lot of the wheel well there. And then I've got our uh, adjustable short arms on there so I can center up the wheels in the wheel well. Because even from factory, they're not in the best spot. So I could just make a little tweak there. And then I have to trim my rock guard. Like a little bit of trimming, but there wasn't much to it. But I mean... That's strictly like a, a street Jeep. You would not, you would not have a hope in taking that thing off road and being successful with that, uh, with the no lift. With that said, I've sold that Jeep to uh, my brother, and he's gonna stuff a small lift in it because him and his wife want to take it out on some some mile trails and whatnot. So oh, nice. we're, we're we're in the works of doing that. But yeah, it was thirty sevens no lift. It, it worked. It was wicked. Take my kids to school, come to work, commute. But uh, yeah. no, you would not. Uh, you would not take that thing trail bound. It's not not what you would want. Right on. Yeah, it looked awesome though. I mean, like look at it. Cause you always tell when it's Tim going down the street because you know regular height Jeep, but these giant wheels and they were sick. They looked great. So um, from a street perspective, you know it's the benefits of having a backup off road vehicle, right? <laughs> so yeah, for, for sure. Awesome. Okay, cool. So Ryan, when we're talking about thirty sevens, is that is that sort of like the cusp of like 35s, you can kind of throw on and do a couple of little things here and there, and you're okay. But now we get into 37s, and it's like you, you really have to get a decent lift. You'll probably want to at least be running, say, 410s and, and definitely be looking at, at uh, the speedometer, you know, whether it's a super chip or whatever the case may be. Yeah, and then another thing we didn't really touch on is, like, you know, trust in the axles. You know what I mean? That's a big deal. Um, there's going to be a lot of... <clears throat> pressure from those bigger tires it depends on you too like you could just open this other can of, it's everything all these the jeep stuff's a huge can of worms kind of depends you, you, there's just no there's no end right right but yeah definitely you know 37s 410s are kind of be there that's kind of their tipping point you know you're gonna be right there like feeling it you know like and then uh especially like even 35s like we got some axles you know the the oe stuff right so like like tim's got some some trusses and some gussets and some, you know, tube uh, sleeves for the tubes and stuff. Like, we put them on 100 years ago, and we wrote an article for Canna Four Wheel Drive about it. We used the TMR tubes, sleeves, and stuff. And I find they're maybe a little more work than the than the trusses. Just like drilling all those goddamn holes in the axle and plug rolling them all. But uh, I do, I think I if I had to pick, I'd favor the trusses because when they're on, they look cooler. Yeah, and they look cool. Yeah, it looks like you did something cool, and they and they work. I'd imagine, hey Tim, they work the same kind of level of strength or ish. I think the external stronger. Um, we're, we're building up like sectional height. It's essentially like like building a bridge, right? We've added more yeah. structure. So yeah, we we discoed the tube sleeves a while back because we found most people preferred. I think the external stronger, and like you say, there's there's a cosmetic benefit to it too. I mean, I don't think people like spending money, and it doesn't look like you spent any money on your Jeep. Like, yeah. yeah I always, joke to people like if you don't really know this hobby i'm like you could throw 30 grand under the bottom of a jeep and axles aftermarket transfer case from advanced adapters like an atlas and whatnot and i'm like your friend had come to your jeep and not know a fucking thing changed and you you sunk 30 grand under that thing like that that's serious i mean spend 30 grand on a camaro i think someone's gonna sure as fuck notice it so yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the external trusses are stronger and cosmetically look better so we found they, they kind of dominated the market over the uh, tube sleeves yeah and you don't kill yourself drilling all those goddamn holes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely less uh, disassembly. It's all external work. Obviously, I think you got to be a little – hopefully you're a skilled welder when, when burning those on because I see some guys look like uh, look like a single came by and shot on it. But because uh, <laughs> externally, you see all that work. So, 
just make sure if, if you're welding it or your friend or a shop, obviously that, that they're competent and going to do a good job on that. Cool. Oh, well, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and so then, so when we're talking about just even the 37s and, and the lift that we need, do we, are, do, are we into long arm, arm kits at that point? Or are we, Tim, are we good with oh. mid arms? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> oh, yeah, but no, well, but are, are we into long arms or? We got a Baltech kit that that they uh, that they wanted us to try out on our JK, and it's all adjustable arms, and uh, it's just the short arm, like just in the normal OE locations. And uh, I got some uh, Aries flat fenders on it. Those are actually my favorite flat fender, um, only because they're they're pretty rigid. They're aluminum powder coated, so they're kind of cool that way, where they don't they don't rot out. But uh, so we're running 40s on it, and uh, it'll do everything. So just like a, just a regular short arm, fully adjustable, so you can get everything dialed in where you want. I mean, yeah, would I prefer a long arm? Probably, definitely for uh, drivability. But there is enough to get the caster where the where the steering wheel feedback feels the way it should, and uh, it does articulate really well. I mean, even before when we had like, did we just through different parts at it over the years and it was running 40s with just a with a nothing kit like just a makeup kit i mean we talked about it before but you don't need a long arm to you know to run 37s you know what i mean it just depends on you if you got the cash you're gonna love it but if if you want to just run it with the short arm i you know i would just get a reasonable one with some adjustable joints so you can kind of dial it in you know what i mean right on okay and that's your jk right that you had the uh yeah the JK's got just a just a short arm kit in. Like now, it's got a full new kit we just put in a few weeks ago. Uh, we haven't had a chance to go anywhere and test it. I didn't even put on the ramp. I don't even. We didn't even bump stop it yet to check it. You know what I mean? I just as soon as I put crap like that on, my wife wants to drive it, right? So <laughs> just like this, thing, she, I still I showed her a picture of the <clears throat> the jail. She goes, "Oh, when can I do all this?" I said, "It's not ready." You know, so. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I don't get to do, none of this stuff's mine. She just takes it. And there you I don't go. know. I just, I just I walk the trail, so yeah, it's good for my bikini body. That's about it. <laughs> nice. Okay. Cool. All right. Good. Um, okay. So then, I guess the last category, and just to sum up, I guess the thirty sevens. We're saying thirty seven, same sort of idea. We, you know, you might want to start looking into at least the idea of regearing is probably an is a, is a good idea at that point. Trusses. A good kit with some adjustable arms, and uh, that's kind of the basics. And obviously, we talk about the programmer yep. and all that kind yep. of stuff. Like those are probably key. You know what I mean? If you can do all that, you'll be happy. Uh, you can even do it in stages. You know what I mean? Like if you want to use your cell phone and save up the extra cash to buy that couple hundred dollar piece of equipment after you spent lift rims, tires, cool. You know where you're at, or just keep it in the dash. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you want to get some trusses, but you got to wait, then you know, take it easy. You know what I mean? I, that kind of stuff, but uh, the problem is lift rims, tires kind of go hand in hand. You got to bite that big elephant off right away, you know, in that sense. Sure. No, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, cool. And then, and then, so I guess 38s and plus, right? So 40s, 41s, 42s. At that point, I, I assume we're saying like we 100%, you're talking definite regear. Well, Tim, the your JK, what, I mean, I, I'm sure you did a lot of extras to it, but to, to run those 41s, did, what are we talking about? Yeah, so it's uh, it's running 538 ring and pinion uh, with a 42. Keep in mind, it's on a Dana 60 in the front and a 14 bolt in the rear. So it's true one ton axles. So this plays a lot like to what Ryan's saying. If you got stock axles going lower than 488 is questionable because that pinion head's going to get really small. Definitely going to be a weak point. So yeah, if you have, to me, what I consider the proper axles to run a 40 inch or larger tire then then yeah you can definitely gear deeper i would go 538 i mean i've got that with uh it's got a 500 horsepower ls3 in it and i don't think it's over geared so yeah if you got the big disc definitely go 538 go low you're good you want that extra mechanical advantage to try and try and make up for that bigger tire size you put on the axle and in terms of other stuff for 40s it just depends how you play i mean if it's mostly a street jeep and you hit some mild trails i see people run those on stock axles that are Trust gusseted, beefed up, and regeared. Um, if you're hard on shit and ever get air under your tires, or you're one of those people that just flogs it, it's time for one tons. Whether that's we build a set of junkyard axles or you buy a set of uh, bolt and crate axles, but uh, 
to me, if you're hard on your stuff, five bolt axles and, and 40 inch or larger tires don't mix. So that's that's kind of cost. But you just got to be real about what you're going to want to do with it. Keep in mind, even if it's a street drive, that's going to accelerate the wear on parts much faster. Exactly. Sort of ball joints, tie rod ends, uh, unit bearings, you name it. That stuff's going to get eaten up quick. So some people put a 40 on a stock axle, run around. They haven't broken anything, think like, oh, this is a huge success. But then you got to look at all the, the wear and added associated maintenance. So I'm not telling people don't do it. I never tell people what to, to do or not to do. Just in my advice, if you want to wheel that thing hard and if you got a 40-inch tire, you're probably wanting to put it places where you are going to use it hard, then, yeah, it's, it's time to start looking at axles for sure. Got it. Okay. And, Ryan, on the on the JL oh, side oh. of things, obviously you're running now – a, a tire very similar in size is it similar is it the same thing as the jk in, in that respect or or is there something yeah. else to consider because of the jl well you know what i'm not <clears throat> i'm not sure on the 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 weakness of the jl axle yet sure. it does have that disconnect similar to the yj and they did that for like calculated fuel economy so they could run the you know build the hellcats and all that fun stuff right when they have that big umbrella so it's fractionally better on fuel fits into that that equation and kind of helps them out with their overall gas consumption as a manufacturer um so i think that's going to be another weak point um we just put we just put that thing together because we wanted to we don't plan on killing it right now but like i said we're we're just going to toot around we're going to do some little trails we're going to do some photos we're going to you know it's going to be like a like a model you know what i mean for sure. now because we just have we were on time constraints and like we were so far in now and all that changed so we're just finishing it we're going to use it for the summer and then we're going to look at <clears throat> if we do some junkers or if we do like we just you know bite the bullet and buy some crate axles or you know put some together with a relationship where we we kind of work together uh for a promo standpoint and get some like dyno tracks or terra flexes or you know we'll, we'll go to like a one ton like a dana 60 or uh or whatever you know what i mean and then then we'll feel a lot more comfortable like i i know for a fact yeah i'm gonna shred out a lot of stuff on there uh like in their brand new rubicon axles but it is what it is for now you know what i mean so yeah you're gonna create a lot more heat a lot more stress you know even like low speed turning you know what i mean all that stuff's gonna play into tearing it apart even potholes on the road you're gonna have all that extra feedback from the giant tire like just moving those mini little ball joints around and stuff so yeah the only difference is i i i'm aware and uh i'm accepting of it some, some people wouldn't be so um if you're running something like that for real and you're not really mechanically savvy uh i suggest you just get someone to look at the front end the steering the ball joints the tire ends you know way more like prematurely than you would think on a on a stock vehicle so <clears throat> modified vehicles are modified maintenance and especially if you don't know what you're after like just for safety of you your family other people's families on the road um you know just put that thing in like you know i don't care what the service says in the manual for the oe but you want to get someone to take a look at those wheel bearings and you know if you're running it for all summer like before the fall like just just rules of thumb you're like hey i'm just gonna send it in it's like for us, it's like a half hour. We'll go over the whole front end, the whole deal, right? Just for peace of mind, especially if you're overdoing it. You know, like, I'll check, and personally, I'll check that JL once we get it out, and we're going to take it even on a one-on-one, and we'll see how it does on just a little extra obstacle or something. But as soon as it comes home, we'll put it up, and I'll check everything. We'll check the steering. We'll check the ball joints. We'll check the tire ends. We'll check the U-joints. We'll check the drive shafts. You know, even our – same with the JK. It's got a, <clears throat> a little bit bigger diff in the front. It's got the G2, the Dana 44 option. It's quite a bit bigger than the OE, but I still check it. And then we run Kamali shafts in the rear of the stock owner's truss with Tim's truss. And uh, I still check all that stuff because it's still got little wheel bearings. It's still got little case bearings and pinion bearings. And we check, like, you know, pinion play and all that stuff, man, because, like I said, you're kind of almost on borrowed time when you start playing that game with the, the 40s and wheeling it. And if you've ever seen videos of my wife driving, she's not nice to anything I own. <laughs> nice. Okay, good. So, no, I think that's really good, especially if you are using it as like a daily or, you know, tooting around with your kids in it. Um, probably a good idea to be overly cautious when you're running such a, you know, a big wheel, um, especially if you're running it on, you know, stock axles and ball joints and all that fun stuff. So. Uh, cool. No, I think that's really that's really important, especially like you say, if you're not mechanically inclined, just get it in there and get it looked at. Totally. Uh, 
Cool. I love it. Okay. So how about when we're talking about the, the tire type itself, you know, there's, I mean, everyone wants the more aggressive look. But then everyone's like, you know, they want the aggressive look, but they don't really want the noise for whatever reason, right? Like, I don't, I don't want to hear the tire. When we're talking the difference between mud and all-terrain tires, what are some of the pros and cons in terms of, like, things that, that are better off-road, things that may be worse in terms of tire wear, etc.? Tim, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Obviously, an all-terrain is going to be better suited to road driving than a mud terrain is. <clears throat> off-road performance of mud train is going to be much better a mud train is also generally going to have a stronger and more robust sidewall so that's going to be another off-road advantage to it Pers- personally I, w- I wouldn't put an all train on on a wrangler if you're going with a bigger wheel and tire because i feel like you probably want that off-road performance even if you don't want that off-road performance you want that look even if it's street street most people want the look of a mud train um, yeah you are going to sacrifice road you're going to sacrifice ride quality a little bit yeah you're going to hear it a little bit more, but most mo- modern mud trains are the same as like most people when they think a loud tire, they're thinking like a bogger or an Interco product. And I mean, that's not what most people run in on Jeeps nowadays. So I would steer most people towards a mud train just because I've seen a mm. lot of friends and customers buy a newer Jeep, think, oh, I, I drive this. I get out off road like two or three times a week, a year. So like I'm going to put an all train on it. They put an all train on it and they're like, well, that looks like shit. I spent <laughs> all this money and I, I barely changed the look of the thing. And I wanted it to look like a badass Jeep that uh, I can take places. So I like on my, my wife's got a Grand Cherokee. It's getting an all-terrain because it's, it's never going off-road. So I think that's the better option for that. But on an, on a Wrangler, I think even if you're not taking it off-road, you probably still want the the look of a mud train, even if you don't want the performance. So that's just my personal advice. Um, yeah. cry, cry once, buy once, just get what you really want, as opposed to buying an all-terrain, being disappointed. And six months later, you're shopping for new tires. I think that's just terrible money spent. Yeah, cool, awesome. All right, uh, Ryan, uh, same sort of feedback, uh, I suppose, on your... There's a, there's a little bit of nuances within that. <clears throat> like, they have, like, uh, like they come with, like, a hybrid tire, so it's it's a, it's still, like, a... It tries to function like an all-terrain, but it has a little more beast, so they have a little more aggressive-looking sidewall. It's going to have the lugs where they're a little more separated, not as much as a mud terrain, but more than an all-terrain. You know, like like tow RTs, and uh, there's a couple of different ones that are pretty good. The only time I find that like an AT looks good is if it is a little more aggressive, right? And uh, it depends on the look. Like some people like <clears throat> we got customers like they want a beachy looking Jeep, true, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. we do get into some that don't look too bad um, with an AT. Like uh, we got real good success with Falcons. And I actually took one of my customers because he drives a lot. And he wanted kind of what Tim said. He wanted the look and stuff. But uh, so two two stories of this one quickly. We took him out. 35s, two-door JK. We took him to Greens. Uh, some people know Greens Mountain. Some people won't. Tim will know it. Um, he did it in a Falcon AT. And, like, I was like, oh, I'm going to have to watch this guy real hard and, like, help him and stuff. And the fucking tire did awesome. Like, <laughs> Way more awesome than I would have ever bet. If you, I'd have bet ten grand that that tire is going to eat shit on this, and it was greasy and everything. And it actually was like, wow. So, I was impressed with that particular tire on that weekend. Uh, that being said, uh, we were running Baja bosses on uh, on the jail for a little while, thirty sevens, and then uh, his name's Jason. Jason came in. He's like, dude, I want, I want to look tougher, right? So he did what Tim said. So he he bought twice, you know, and he went up to thirty seven Baja bosses. Now you, you can't even get away from it. He just stares at his Jeep all day. You know what I mean? So uh, you know, kind of that's it. But yeah, the only difference I think would be just if you wanted that middle of the road, you can look at a few different models that are like the hybrid tire and just see if that kind of fits your bill. If you like the style, um, I I do for sure. Like they they definitely have to have an application and then on the really extreme side of things would be like the comp tires right you know tim's probably got mostly comp tires on his his machines minus the road ones um i drive comp tires on the road in the summer because i find they check crack anyways before they get all beat down so i mean whatever might as well look super cool put up with the morning flintstone ride and you got about eight minutes of this and then they smooth out again every day but that's (laughs) the shit i'm all joints and wheel brakes too so if you're gonna run a comp tire all the time they're gonna square up like flat spot overnight and if it's cold i think anything below like 15 or 18 degrees the damn tires are square so <laughs> gotta watch that too but uh, i'm probably one of the only people that are dumb enough to drive them as daily anyway so well actually christina <laughs> drives them as daily but oh there you go yeah. <laughs> um yeah. and i think tim you mentioned what about sidewall 
strength when it comes to airing down. Is, sure. is there That's, a difference? Yeah, for sure. Uh, that that all terrain is going to be a lighter tire and generally of lighter construction. That mud terrain is going to have more material generally in the sidewall. And oftentimes the tread will extend over the sidewall kind of as, as a cap on like the, the corner of the radius. So when you're airing down, uh, under most circumstances, that mud terrain is going to be more impervious to damage from rocks, tree stumps, um, and other debris. So I would be more confident airing a mud terrain to a lower tire pressure than I would uh, in all terrains. So yeah, there's definitely a give and take there of, of durability, I believe. Okay, cool. And so sort of switching gears that in that, um, you know, we have tires, but we also want to talk about wheels. Ryan wheels aluminum versus steel is there really is there even a discussion or is it just aluminum or is there a place for steel um i i personally don't enjoy steel wheels um they're usually welded together and usually they're never true they're like eggs like they're not round you know what i mean so you're gonna find they're hard to balance <clears throat> you know what i mean um the, the benefits to steel wheel like for the old school dudes are like yeah if you hit it on a rock and you bend it up you just get a hammer whack her back into place, clean it up, and air it back up. You know what I mean? Like, there's that, which is true. I just find they're just they're just not manufactured consistently. They're heavy. You know, and generally, they're hideous. You know what I mean? There's not too many cool-looking steel wheels out there. Um, but they do have their place. You know what I mean? If you just have a trail only, you, you know, you want to put your money into the cool tire versus you don't care about the wheel. Um, yeah, that's there. Uh, they still come in reasonable sizes, like 17s. You're not going to get a 20-inch steel wheel or anything like that. And, uh, yeah, that's kind of my thing. I personally just run aluminum wheels. Like, yeah, they, they just cut like butter on, on all the rocks and stuff. Like you make them look pretty hideous pretty quick, but yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just like them. Better, okay, you know? cool. No, and that's, that was sort of my question. Do, do you, do you run steel at all or just a hundred percent aluminum, even in the race series? No, aluminum, everything. Um, they're stronger wheel, they're better construction. Like Ryan's saying, that is an old school adage that if you bend a steel wheel, you can smash it with a hammer. Um, <laughs> I'd rather just run a wheel off the hop that I don't have to ever take a hammer to and I don't ever have to bend. A lot of people on a race series, like yeah. in the in the stock class, they'll run a steel wheel and that's for affordability and I totally respect that. But I see a lot of bend wheels and I see a lot of people taking hammers to steel wheels if they're running a, a premium beadlock, they're not going to have those issues. I run, so yeah, I definitely run aluminum wheels on everything, whether that's a street Jeep, off-road Jeep, race Jeep, uh, whatever. Yeah, I, I'd say aluminum all the way. The other terrible thing about steel wheels is I remember when I first got a TJ, I wanted some steel wheels. American Racing 767s, like that was all the rage back on my YJs and TJs. Like Ryan's laughing because I'm sure he sold a million of them. But uh, after you get some winter... Um, <laughs> If you get some winter in the rust belt, those things look like shit after a year. Yeah, your aluminum wheel might oxidize, like oxide if it's uh, if it's a plain face, but at least you can manually polish that and buff it up. But uh, your steel wheels are just going to look ratchet. There's a lot of crevices and cracks for uh, salt, brine, and other debris to sit and rot out. Um, so yeah, I don't really see any advantage to a steel wheel nowadays. I don't I don't think they have much of a of a, of a place anymore. Okay, cool. Well, you touched on it there. What about beadlock? Let's talk about maybe the advantages of those, especially when it comes to tire size. So, Tim, why don't you just, because you mentioned it there, why don't you explain what a beadlock is? Sure. So, uh, a beadlock is a mechanical clamping device that uh, whole actually physically clamps the outer bead of your tire between a beadlock ring, like a locking ring, and an inner ring, which is either machined into a wheel on an aluminum wheel or welded in on a steel wheel. So... A lot of people are scared of these things on road. If you're running a quality set or you set it up properly, uh, in my opinion, you're not going to have any issues. With that said, they do require periodic checks or more maintenance. Like when I was talking about any earlier, like a modified vehicle, modified maintenance schedule. Um, so just something that you want to keep an eye on. I've ran do-it-yourself steel ones like we make. Basically, that is you take a steel wheel, you do some welding on it, and you convert it to a beadlock. I ran those on the road fine and uh, haven't had any issues. I always check the bolts. On any of my newer stuff, I've just converted to aluminum for all the benefits we talked about earlier. But yeah, a B-block is definitely, let's call it more in the hardcore spectrum mm -hmm. of uh, Jeep and off-road use because it is going to allow you to run a much lower air pressure. But uh, if you get out a handful of times a year and, and spend most of your time on the street, you probably want to just shy away from a B-block because you're just going to lessen your, your maintenance and schedule load. Just keep in mind if you're out with a group and someone else is airing down their tire much lower than you, but they're running a beadlock, I wouldn't recommend doing the same. You're going to want to keep a little, a little more uh, 
pressure on that tire to keep it locked on the bead so you're not going to lose a tire bead off road. Cool. All right, Ryan. And Ryan, um, you wrote an article. I don't know if it's actually been published yet or not, but I know that I read it. Well, you talked about street lockers. Can you explain what those are? Oh, it just, it's just, uh, it just gives you that look. It's just aesthetic. You know what I mean? The people call it like a street lock. A street lock? Yeah, that um, is, yeah. That's all it's doing. It just kind of mimics. Yeah, it just mimics that look. You know what I mean? So. Okay, cool. So, not, not much to it. And you're sort of in the same opinion. You know, B locks are great, but. If you're not getting it all that often, maybe not the best choice. Or I know that's super popular, right? Like I know, like everywhere, especially in the U.S., it seems like everyone's like switching over to bead lock. It just main, it just maintenance. You know what I mean? So you just want to maintain it. You know, check the. You're just gonna go with the torque, right? You know, every oil change or whatever, and give her a little torque and make sure everything's good. Cool. You know, I mean, even if you do it when you rotate your tires, you know, it just has a rule of thumb: just check the torque. We run them. We run the AV. Uh, I think they're Boras on the uh, on the JK. So I I like them. They just on the road all all the time. There are some like off road ones, and there are some like street approved ones. Um, not street locks. Not to be confused with that. Like a real bead lock that is still a DOT wheel. I think Walker Evans has some. And uh, cool. yeah, I, I don't know if the AV ones are now. Just come to think of it, I didn't <laughs> really pay attention. I just put them on. Right. I was like, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Yeah. Them, right? so. yeah, I think we're looking at uh, it was a dirty life for for the new JL, okay. I think. But we're just gonna get the 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 uh, rash rings, which are pretty sick. I mean, I, those wheels look pretty awesome. So I've heard some good things. So we're uh, exploring that. So cool, um, Ryan. Let's talk about backspace and offset. That's one as we were talking about before. That for me, I just I always have to refer back just to figure out exactly like you know what the difference between backspace and offset is and how they work why don't you uh i think you you had a pretty good explanation of how that all worked yeah so uh <clears throat> so backspacing is just you have your total rim inner dimension and then you have you have centers at zero and then you have you know so many inches from the back from the mounting face of the wheel to the back lip of the rim right so that's giving you your backspace and then from for offset, you're going to have offset of zero, right? So if you're going to have so many millimeters positive and there are so many millimeters negative, right? So if I have a negative mounting face of like six mil negative, so it's going to push the wheel out from there six millimeters or 12 millimeters or 24 or, you know, 18, 24, you know, 44, 52, that kind of stuff, 53. So that's going to keep pushing it out. So what that does is, so the, you're going to have more of a more of a lip on the wheel, the more negative, and the wheel's going to stick out further. So you're going to have more of the wheel from center outside of the vehicle, right? And so like like a Grand Cherokee could be like a plus, <clears throat> like a plus 30, uh, 33 or 35 or 30 millimeter. So you're going to see that wheel is pretty thick, but it's just really inside the fender of, the, of a Grand Cherokee, whereas a Jeep could be, you know, maybe it's positive 10 or something, but then you're going to want, if you want that look, you're going to want a negative offset. You know what I mean? So, and there's just some weird instances where like the mounting, uh, face is really thick. So you'll get a rim that looks really faced, you know, with no lip, but it still sticks out pretty far. So there's a couple of those scenarios. Like, uh, I know like the rhino wheels, like those military looking wheels, like their, their mounting thickness is massive where some of them are like this, right? So there's are like triple, the regular wheel so so you get that face where it looks like a positive offset wheel but it's actually negative right okay right on. so or then that. so that'll help or could <clears throat> potentially help put a larger wheel on a yes. lower lift correct well you're going to get into the sweep radius of the of the tire too right so so the further out i put the wheel the larger the sweep radius is so that's going to give me more potential contact with the front and rear fenders, right? Like the front corner of the fender or the bumper or the valence or the rear, you know what I mean? And then you got to remember your axle travels, you know, up and down and moves forward and back like when you're when you're off road, right? So that's why stubby bumpers are popular, right? Cuz the axle's compressing and it's going forward, you're going to turn your wheel, you're sending your tire up and forward. So you want to get rid of that all that bumpers in the way, right? And the more the more offset you got like yeah, you want offset because you want to clear the control irons when you're turning, but you need to make sure it's not too much 
or you got to clearance the front parts, like the front bumper, like we were talking about, or like <clears throat> maybe you have a rock rail or something, you know, there's all kinds of different little things that can get in the way. So, you know, the, there's sometimes too much offset or some people buy a big offset wheel and then put a wheel spacer on it, which makes it even more intense. Yeah. Right. So, um, well, you just gotta be prepared for that. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, and it's funny cause I always, Tim, what are your experience with wheel spacers? I was going to mention that. I know a lot of people go that route, try to keep stock yeah. wheel and just throw a spacer on it. Yeah. Or like Ryan said, aftermarket, we want to throw a spacer on there too. I like that look myself for something that's street driven, but, uh, if it's a quality machine spacer, and we're talking machine from a billet aluminum, um, not a cast aluminum piece that's that's post machined. In my experience, they're good to go. You basically, you're gonna bolt that wheel to your brake mounting surface like you would a wheel. The spacer's going on there. Torque it, use thread locker, and then nut your wheel regularly as long as you if periodically check those things. They don't really have any issues that I see. I've had customers purchase them and then come back and they have a broken stud or a weird story like that. I remember one kid had a broken stud. So I'm like, well, what happened? Cause I'm like, the stud doesn't just, just fail. What happened? Oh, I don't know. And I'm like, well, what'd you torque it to? Well, I had a four foot bar and I hopped on the end and I'm 250 pounds. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah. man, you, you mechanically <laughs> broke it. The wheel spacer did not fail on you. You went way beyond yield on that bolt and broke it. So, I mean, uh, if you're not confident in mounting that and torquing it properly, get it to a shop that is confident in doing it. There's so, sh some shops that are scared of it. Like Ryan mentioned earlier, sometimes with this off-road stuff, you don't want to go to your local tire shop. You want to go to an off-road shop because tire shops are just like, they don't want to modify much. And if it's out of their wheelhouse, they're not super confident in it. A lot of the bad uh, rep or shit talk you'll see on wheel spacers is literally like a slip on spacer. So it'll be like quarter inch <laughs> thick, half inch thick, and it just slips over your existing wheel studs. Usually they're like a cast piece of shit. Like most of the ones I've seen aren't even flat. Like they're, they're terrible. They, they came straight out of coronavirus land. Um, <laughs> uh, those ones reduce your, your thread engagement. I do not recommend those. I recommend a bolt on spacer or a lot of people refer to it as an adapter. But if it's a quality aluminum piece from a vendor you trust, I don't see any issues with them at all. Okay, cool. I was going to say yeah, that's uh... match up the wheel stud too. That's important. I was going to so say, like, that I, I know it's controversial. So, Ryan, I was going to say, I, I wanted your thoughts on that as well. No, oh, I love, like, they, like, really, wheel adapters is what they're trying to call them now to separate from the spacer, like what Tim was saying. So, I would just make sure <clears throat> that if you have a 14 mil stud, buy a 14 mil studded spacer, not, not a half inch or 7 sixteenths or something like that. So, you want to make sure you match the studs because they're going to have to hold the load you know that's what they're designed to do right so that'd be the only thing yeah you can be like oh they're they are aluminum and this that, and the other but if you don't check the stud size you're going to be in for some hurt right yeah for sure yeah no i think it's like anything else right like if you if you go to somebody who knows what they are doing and gets you the proper product for what you're trying to achieve then you know it makes sense um like i said i i just when i first got the jeep i i was looking for myself or like spacers and what have you and it is just a divided internet in terms of like half the people are like, yeah, it's amazing. They're great. The other half are like, I had one broke the stud and you know, my wheel almost fell off. <laughs> so mostly, mostly human error, man. Yeah. Which makes mostly. a lot of sense, right? You know, if, you're, if yeah. you don't know what you're doing, you're over torquing or under torquing or right. whatever the case may be, uh, or not getting the right product. Uh, it's not made out of the proper material, uh, billet versus cast or what have you, you know, it's like anything else. You, you know yep. get the wrong product for the wrong application you know that's it cool awesome all right well that's good to know so i think we have covered an absolute monster amount of data and information today so hopefully people um can uh, ingest and absorb we have a couple questions i think we've probably answered them to be honest uh but let's go through them let's uh let's uh let's see what we got and uh we'll start uh, Tim, we'll start with you. I think Ryan's just plugging in his computer there, which is cool. Uh, this one's from Mike's, Mike's O2, whatever. So uh, driving a JL Sport, um, should you re-gear for 35s? And if so, what gearing? Also, any idea on what I can <coughs> expect to pay for something like that? Um, maybe we can talk about the first part, and then we'll switch over to Ryan for the second part, but yeah. Um, 35 is what should we re-gear to if, if we're gearing at all? Like I said, we may have already answered it, but 
Yeah, I mean, we've covered a lot of it. Um, being that it's a sport, he's going to be one of the, the higher gear ratios. not going to be 410. I would, um, if, if you're tight for budget, throw those 35s on there, drive it, and see what you think of it. Some people would be totally cool with that. Some people would say, no, this is shit. I want to get in for uh, a rear gear right away. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll throw it to Ryan. He's going to be able to give this gentleman the best advice for ratio, and uh, cost is going to be over the map. But, uh, yeah, what do you think on ratio, Ryan? Yeah, um, really depends. <clears throat> I don't, we usually ask our customers like drivability. So, are you going to do a lot of like highway driving? Do you commute with it often? You know what I mean. You know, even if so, there's really there's really just two choices. You know, at that point. So, if you, I would do if you're doing a lot of highway and you still want some pep and you want final drive, you know, do the four. Um, if you wanted a higher revving final drive because you want to do more off-road and a little more pep you know you're driving a lot through town do the 488s you know it'd be pretty steep <clears throat> but that's kind of uh kind of you you got to figure out what you're doing like if i was going to commute with the jeep i would give that little bit of i'll leave it a little bit of a highway gear like like 456 you know what i mean it's not a highway gear but you know basically on the ratio right but if you're going to do a lot of in town and you want some off-road performance um I would do the uh, the 488. So that's kind of the two. You know, I wouldn't go and put 410s and run 35s because the chances are most people will outgrow it too, I right? I was going like, say, right? Yeah, they'll move to the 37s yeah, so, or what have you. Yeah, and you're okay. So you're on the bottom end. If you did 456 and 37s, you know, you're still good. You know what I mean? But if you did 450, 450 or sorry, 488 and went to 37s next year or whatever, you're perfect. You know what I mean? And then you can even go 48s and 40s like we do. And it's it's runs on the highway just fine. I did it on a whole bunch of other Jeeps I had, like, and I drive, you know, five hours on, the on like, a major highway, like an interstate-style highway, and it, it was fine. Six gear, you're just cruising, motor's happy, and you still got a lot of power. I mean, not a lot of power. No Jeep has a lot of power. <laughs> Comparatively speaking. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think that would be it. You just make that decision. Okay, cool um perfect all right so and yeah Price, just, uh, prices over the map but i'd say expect to be like two thousand to twenty five hundred dollars probably you know all in you know for both diffs labor fluids gears bearings install kits all that fun stuff okay it'd be somewhere in that range got it okay cool yeah and i and you know i, I again I, i'll say it I, I have the 373s with 35s with manual transmission and as soon as i put in the that flash cal um i have no issues with the jeep whatsoever in terms of like it, it runs great on the highway it works well off road like it i have no issues whatsoever so uh yeah <clears throat> just to throw in my two cents there <laughs> all right answered it a few times so the idea is this is from Re reggie he's got a 2016 jku sport with three six uh panastar three seven three gears six speed manual doesn't intend to re-gear anytime soon does want to move to 35s um and is just worried if yeah. if moving to 35s yeah. is going to cause a problem no, that's good just do it yeah yeah and that's Maybe. what i was gonna say i did it i've been running them for now a couple of years and no issues whatsoever no oh, you answered the question yeah perfect done okay so <laughs> andrew <laughs> uh this is andrew he's asking uh okay so he's looking for a, a tire that performs well on road and off road um, and he's curious in your experience, we'll start with you, Ryan, then we'll go to Tim in your experience. Are there any brands to stay away from just absolutely terrible tires? Oh, totally. Not to say anything against the Pakistan, but stay away from tires produced in Pakistan. They don't have a whole lot of plumbing, so they don't really do a good job making tires. Not like that's really correlating, but it's, uh, yeah, like amp tires. Sorry. I don't. We don't even sell them. I won't even sell them no matter what. You could beg me to sell you something. I just to say no because you're not going to be happy. So, no, I don't do amp tires. I don't do uh, Turo tires. Uh, I try and stay with like away from like Happy U Day tires. You know what I mean? Like the super Asian tires that are crazy brutal. Um, yeah, I don't know. Those would be the ones I stay away from. Okay, cool. Uh, We're going to try these uh, those Fury tires just to see. Okay. I don't know what they're going to be like, but we're just going to do, we're going to feel them out. But all the other tires of <clears throat> those tires I mentioned, besides the made up super China tire, um, <laughs> they're brutal. I've had bad, like we've had to like, you know, customers have bought them 
unknown because it just sounded good because I know tires are expensive, right? So all the bad characteristics of the tire. The other tire from a good company that I don't like is like that Nito Mud Grappler. Like it looks like pizza slices with dinosaur feet on the side. You know that one. Everyone loves that tire. It's the worst fucking tire in the world. <laughs> Like, it sucks for all the stuff you don't want, like shifted belts, core challenges, you know, uneven wear, noisy, hard to balance. Like, all the characteristics you want on a tire to be good, it's bad. The only thing, it looks, it looks cool. That's it. That's it. Okay, it's good. Tire. No, that's good to yeah. know. That's actually really good to know. Good good information. Tim, how about yourself? Uh, Ryan, Ryan mentioned one there that uh, I would also steer clear from, or in my experience anyways, I, we uh, try to set up uh, 35 inch Aturos on uh, my sister-in-law's TJ. They make a good looking mud train, looks very similar to a uh, Toyo Open Country MT or the Netto Trail Grappler. And those tires were sh- absolute shit in the rain. I don't know what they built them out of, but they felt soft. Like there was not, there was physically nothing felt wrong about the tire. But uh, if you touch the brakes in the rain, you were, you were just going for a drift um vin diesel style so uh though those i would definitely stay away from unless they've made improvements and in terms of tires i like nitto uh toyo those are basically two sister companies anyways um i've had good luck as well with uh bf goodrich and uh maxis for an off-road application to make some some badass tires but uh and i know ryan's run a lot of mickey thompson stuff with success so i would yeah. stick with the, big, the big players they spend the most money on r&d molding using quality materials so I just like to stick to the big names for the tires because I feel they're always uh, pushing the sport, making uh, progress and improvements. So I think if you stick with uh, a known brand, you're going to have good success. Awesome. Okay, I love it. All right, good. Um, all right, well, I think that's it for the questions. I, and like I said, we covered a ton of information. Uh, anything that we may have missed that we want to quickly touch on? Uh, anyone? Ryan, Tim, anything? Uh, bead, bead locks. Uh, if we're talking bead locks, the number one question I always get are, are they street legal? That's like Good the number question. one question regarding beadlocks. I won't say with 100% certainty they are. Like Ryan touched off, there are some brands that are definitely DOT certified. They're very few and far between. Um, what I will say is in most jurisdictions, there's nothing in the law that prevents them. So uh, in Ontario, our Highway Traffic Act doesn't speak to them. So to me, they're legal. I mean, obviously, these rules can't be written to exclude everything. Um, but I've never had a problem. I've been pulled over for other things, um, but no uh, office of the law has ever spoken to my beadlocks. With that said, most people don't understand how beadlock works. So I think yeah. if, if any law enforcement ever tried to give you shit and you came across polite and you told them they're street lock, I mean, it's just a cosmetic thing. They're not going to know what they're talking about. They're not trained on that because it's so few and far between. So I won't say with 100% certainty they are legal. I will say I don't believe they're illegal, and I, I don't believe it's an issue people come across. So if you want to run them, go ahead and run them. You're not going to have the law breathing down your neck. Awesome. Yeah. I think you'd have to find a police officer that was also an enthusiast, but then somehow hated on your wheels. Right. So I think <laughs> yeah. like a shiny unicorn. Like, I don't think it's going to happen. Like most, most police officers, like normal people, be like, that's a wheel, but you know your signal light's out. Like, here's your ticket. So I think you're going to have a hard time having someone identify. And I think if someone had the know-how – and they were a real enthusiast, they'd probably just chat with you about, you know, whatever cool stuff you got in your Jeep. And I, I've come across that. The most, a lot of police officers are, you know, just human beings too, right? And they're just, uh, you know, I had one the other day. I was going a little too quick. And I just told them, oh, yeah, I put the big tires on. I didn't recalibrate my Speedo, which is total bullshit. I knew exactly how fast I was going. <laughs> and uh, he was super cool. We just chatted for a minute or two. And it was raining too, so I was like, oh, I'm going to take it. <laughs> but uh, he was super cool, and he just chatted about the Jeep, and then we went on our way. Oh, that's awesome. So. Right on. Yeah, I had the same thing. I got pulled over. I, I guess I, I ran a red. Uh, well, it was yellow, right? It was uh, a little too late. I just decided to get through that uh, intersection. Yeah, the guy pulled me over and just started talking to me about my lift and my wheels and the Jeep. And I guess he for- I don't know if he forgot all about what the heck he even pulled me over for, but... He, my kid was in the back, and he just, you know, now my kid wants to be a cop, and I got off with a ticket. It was great. <laughs> That's awesome. Man. Yeah, so cool. All right, awesome. Well, you know what, guys? I This, is, uh, this has been super informative. I think uh, everyone listening, I'm sure, has learned a lot. I know I have every week, I think. Um, so I really appreciate you guys joining, as always. Uh, Ryan, what do you got going on over the next week? Anything, anything we need to... Uh, keep our eyes open for i know again events and what have you are sort of dead but uh yeah 
Um, now we're just we're just gonna finish up. Hopefully, uh, finish up the JL, and then we'll get out, get some get some photos, kind of test it out a little bit here. I got a little mini off road parking on my property here at the shop, and uh, we'll put on our RTI ramp. We got a couple different ones, and probably be a lot of cutting and making those big tires fit and work. So yeah, that's really it for me. That way we'll uh, and then we're gonna move on to putting up some uh, of our prototypes onto the truck. Like onto the Jeep now that we got it back on the ground and uh, just be some prototyping, really. Cool. Right on. Yeah, so uh, so best place to find all that, we'll, uh, we'll put the links down below, but just uh, check out your social media, get some of those pics, see the, the new wheels and the JL rocking and rolling. Awesome. Uh, Tim, how about yourself? Um, we've got uh, a private uh, test and tune race thing we're doing uh, this weekend, which is like a small group of drivers from our race series out at a new track. Um, nice. So that's on Sunday. That's going to be pretty cool. And then, uh, yeah, just always working on our web stuff and getting new products online. We've got a bunch of new stuff coming right now. Um, one this week, it's not really applicable to much of the Jeep crowd unless they've done one tons. It's like a new style Dana 60 high steer arm uh, for the off plus Dana 60 switch is taken off and uh i gotta get figure out how ryan and i can connect so i can get him some uh tmr bumpers for that uh jl we've had that plan for a while we just got to figure out how to uh how to cross paths now. but uh yeah, sure. yeah that's yeah i know well hopefully uh hopefully in the next couple of weeks man and then we'll get it all sorted i just time just flies it's know, so man. terrible yeah like i said i was literally here till like almost four this morning like i work we we're here all day working you know, eight eight thirty to six, and then I went from six to three forty five a.m. and then uh, came back here so I could hit the nine thirty so we could chat. You know what I mean? I'm just wow. <laughs> so that's brutal. crazy. I feel like a zombie. I don't even know how if I answer those questions properly. <laughs> yeah, you're all good. You're good. Awesome. All right. Yeah. So same thing. We'll uh, anyone wants to see what's going on with uh, TMR. Uh, are you going to take some pictures on Sunday? Throw it up on social. Uh, and yeah, so we've got a, uh, a page, which is, uh, for our race series, TMR race series. You can look that up on, uh, Instagram or Facebook. We'll probably post some content there. Um, this thing's kind of private. We're only having a handful sure. of vehicles. It's one person on track at a time. Everyone's got to wear a mask and, and stay social distance. So we're kind of keeping on the down low. So I don't know how much we'll put out there, but, uh, we do kind of want to encourage people. If you've got the opportunity, like get out, have fun, uh, obviously uh, in a safe environment, uh, if you're allowed to. Cool. All right, right on. So we'll we'll put that then uh, the TMR Race Series Instagram link below, and uh, yeah, that's awesome. Well, again, thank you guys so much. It was a uh, really great chat, and I guess we will chat next week. Sounds great. All right, cool. cool.